case, one of the reasons they gutted, they exposed all the problems with the crime lab portion of the coroner's office. And, and the, the lab was nasty and stuff was running. And mm -hmm. Everybody knew who O.J. Simpson's blood and you should never know that. So, um, yeah, it's getting awfully big. So. How, does, how does the lack of ventilation and all that stuff, does that play a part in autopsy? You mentioned earlier that there's some places that are really yeah. dirty, like the ventilation and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, the human body has a very original smell. Yeah. Unlike any animal, you know, uh, decom, uh, the smell is horrible. And if you imagine just going in there, whether you're going to talk to somebody or family's going in to ID somebody and you don't have ventilation, they smell all of that. It's just a stench that you really don't have to have if you have a well built office and you have good ventilation. Not to mention the one talking about TV earlier. Okay. That's circulating around there. And you can still catch TV. So this is why you're supposed to have all those things on. But yeah, and then it kinda just yeah, you, know, you go in there, maybe you have to go to a meeting or go to court and you stink. Uh, that, that that stench is all over the place. So there's uh, separate air handling for positive airflow so that no one has to smell that and that they can kind of clean up and make sure things are clean. If you're smelling that, you know there's some bacteria around. And it's just not good for a good positive work environment. So a couple of years ago, we did have the opportunity to attend an autopsy. And what is it that you think we as defense lawyers should be looking for during an autopsy? You want to get an idea of how a complete autopsy is done and where you can ask questions. And you know, a lot of times when you have again multiple stab wounds, multiple gunshot wounds, um, you want to make sure that the direction is right, uh, that the wound itself is described properly. So you want to make sure that you have a good understanding of what a contact wound is, what a distance wound is, and why that is. Um, you want to make sure that the people are following the protocol, like they're actually initialing the bullet bag and not trying to carve the bullet up. Um, I think you want to get an idea of what goes into an autopsy you're going to be defending and knowing what artifacts can be assumed to be injuries by, by other parties. And that time will change things, the way things appear, and having that kind of general information would, I think, would be helpful to you. I think my biggest problem is the timing mm -hmm. usually pointed after the autopsy has been performed. So there's not very many opportunities to do that. Oh, you're pointing out? Well, I mean, yeah. it just depends how quick. Right. Right? The case gets to court in 24 hours, and maybe there's a possibility. But I've never seen, I've never been had the opportunity to see an autopsy done being performed on a case that I was really? involved in. Mm -hmm. The only autopsies I've seen were part of like a tour or a mm -hmm. class. Uh, have you thought of setting that up? I mean, yeah. Well, I was going to ask about that. So I've never either. And, right. You know, I mean, it, 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 what happens, the way we get our cases is we get called by the court. Yeah. Once the, the defendant is appearing in their court that day. So a number of things have happened before that. You know, there, right. there's been an investigation. Uh, you know, they've been through the magistration. Uh, it's, it's typically not the same day, especially in a case like a murder. Mm -hmm. Probably been questioned, or the police have attempted questions. So a lot of times, probably not. I don't know. Does anybody here have had that opportunity? Mm -hmm. In a natural case? Yeah. 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 No. I mean, maybe the prosecutor, if they're diligent, they could show up. Or if the person dies while the case is pending. That's yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had that experience. That I don't recall having it here, but I did have that experience in uh, Indianapolis. And so I would always say, you know, you both should be there. One's going to be there, the other should be there. I know oftentimes, sometimes the prosecutor will get on the scene. I'm like, mm -hmm. why are you here and the not here? Because mm -hmm. you know, it gives you a different advantage. I don't know if they're willing to do that, but I always suggest that because the more you know, the better you are at doing your job. And if you're not doing your job, then it's not anywhere close to being an equal process. I know in like intoxication manslaughter cases, the prosecutor will show up at the scene. Mm -hmm. So they could technically follow the body to the ME's office, but generally, uh, we get the case about maybe two weeks or so. So you're already behind eight. Right, yeah, we're behind. 
Yeah. Are they filmed? I've never seen a filming one. I've seen autopsy being performed, but not for our clients, and they're not filmed. Could you is know that a we, procedure that could it be implemented or asked for? We tried filming autopsy things back in the mm -hmm. 80s, and they kept catching people saying things mm -hmm. that were inappropriate. Mm -hmm. That was something I literally. <laughs> I remember this former chief medical examiner of Chicago losing his job made a joke. Um, so generally, it's, it's generally small police departments that actually do that filming. Um, people just don't do that anymore. But I, I'm sure they probably would not do that here. But I think you have the, the opportunity to ask on a training program. I mean, I just. I can't imagine somebody not wanting to have as much information as possible. And with the technology in the day and age that we are now in this new facility, I haven't been over there right. yet, but I mean, I imagine like an oscillating camera or something that could video the autopsy that of course, you know, shows a lot of well, legal concerns. I will tell you one thing that I'm actually working on with some colleagues. I attended a meeting on um, telemedicine in Santa Barbara two mm -hmm. weeks ago now. And what we're trying to work on for the court system is actually, it's called a VESPA, but it's like a robotic camera. And you can watch the autopsy being done. Uh, you can't interfere, but you can watch the autopsy being done. It takes photographs, it does x-rays. We're actually going to be trying it out on the court system in Philadelphia. Because this has been an issue. Uh, you want people to see what you're doing, but you don't want them in the autopsy room because you risk getting infected or falling out or whatever. Um, and I, an office that I work with out in uh, San Luis Obispo, California, they actually have a viewing room mm -hmm. where both sides can view the autopsy and not be in there interfering and getting cut. So that's actually a system that's coming out because this is, um, I work with a virtual forensic network now, and it's for that very reason, mm -hmm. so that you can see what happened. And so I think that would, would be, in some ways, very helpful when you can't see what was done. It, I mean, it seems like that would be the next thing, you know, that they could do, but... Well, not well, that it's going to be the next thing, and uh, what we're trying out, like, trying to help people out with, with drug court, traffic court. Um, I'm actually trying to teach through it. I have students in Africa that I'm trying to develop into better forensic pathologists but without me flying over there, mm -hmm. and so they can actually see what I'm doing, and, and I can proctor what they're doing. And this equipment has been used uh, for, for years. And uh, being used actually um, in Houston and a lot of right now for treating stroke and heart attack victims. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an ambulance company here called Harris Ambulance. They actually have this little robotic computer in the ambulance so the doctor can, mm -hmm. prior to the hospital, treat the stroke or heart attack victim. It's also being used from rural areas where you don't have the uh, expertise but the, the doctor can monitor and help the doctor do a consult. There's actually a doctor in France who's never seen a live patient. She actually does everything through telemedicine from Paris, mm -hmm. and she's treating patients in the States. So it has a lot of utility. That's telemedicine, and it's here. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually trying to put it into the forensic setting. So we actually have a virtual forensic network, and we're just getting organized to do this that. I'm also trying to use that same system that we can plug our veterans in and get therapy. I mean, I'm just envisioning it right now, watching an autopsy after the fact, you know, and here it is, and like, oh my gosh, they didn't see that. Don't they see that? I mean, another set of eyes to look at something that somebody just may right. not have seen for whatever, you know, tunnel vision. They see a million autopsies with just another Well, and, and that's why, you know, it's, it's good to have, you know, two heads are, are better than one, just when you have people who are overwhelmed with the number of drug deaths and, you know, accidents. Um, overworked. You know, they make a large number of doctors now in Harris County, but not every office has that. So it has some utility in, in that area. You know, looking back and saying, hey, I reversed those women pathways. So I have a question for you. Um, yes. Nobody, nobody in this office is a doctor of medicine or really forensically trained for this so when we're dealing with cases and we have a a forensics expert or somebody somebody from the ME's office testifying um, and we're not in general really gonna know how to counter what is being said 
especially if they're at that moment, you know, the prosecutor is questioning them. What is our counter for, for what they're saying? Because there's probably counter that we don't know about because we don't have someone here, you know, on, in, on staff to, so how do we get over that hurdle? Because, I, I, I mean, because I've seen it in myself, and I'm, I'm not even an attorney, but I've seen it where, where someone's being questioned and we're like, what is the counter for that? You know, I may hear about it later in the elevator or something like that, but you're like, man, they never even asked me this. Why didn't somebody ask me this? So, Absolutely. And, you know, when I got back here to, to town, I said, you know, I'm just going to call because I was so elated that they finally had you all here. <laughs> because I was, just, I was so tired of these homicide cases. And the defense attorney never called, never sat down, never ran a theory through. Um, you should be able to utilize the medical examiner because they are supposed to be neutral. But again, a lot feel they're an extension of the prosecutor. I've never felt that way. Like I said, Johnny Holmes and I butt it heads all the time because, you know, I'm here for everybody. I'm paid by the taxpayer. Um, one of the greatest counters of all is when they finish the testimony, well, doctor, can you say who did it? The answer is no. <laughs> if they say you did it, they're absolutely biased. That's not our job. It's not our job at all. The only thing that we can say from the crime lab perspective is that the evidence points to, and that's not us. Yeah? You should not have a forensic pathologist giving the DNA report. That needs to be separate. We're supposed to be neutral and, and for both sides. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm hoping that you all are able to have separate confidential meetings with the medical thing. Mm -hmm. We do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, you know, you have to say, hey, how can I counter that? Now, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't. I mean, you know, sometimes I have to tell people you're going to have a hard time with this one. The jury sees this as just going to go down. But hopefully you can make an attempt to ask, ask a question and that they will answer it for you. And then, again, it, it, it might be helpful if you did have someone that you could, you know, talk to in the community or that would come and talk to you on a, on a regular basis. Especially with all the DNA stuff nowadays as well. Yeah, that DNA gets you. I mean, I've got a case in 1993 coming to court next May. It's DNA from a broken bottle that the his attorney's office called me about. Wow, that's that DNA working for you. But I won't be talking about the DNA. I'll be talking about why the person is dead. Mm -hmm. I took two cold cases to court last year that were over 20 years old based upon uh, DNA, and then looking at how faulty the autopsy was and how faulty the photographs were, um, because things come, in, come into question. So with so your role now, are you now available as, as an expert witness? Well, I'm available. I am all over the place. I spend at least two weeks of, of the month going back and forth all over. I have an active license in, in California and uh, here in Indiana and Virginia. So I, I travel quite a bit. But like I said, I'm, I'm available to give advice and, and to discuss an issue. I'm not asking. I think that's important. And a city this size is very important. Are there any treatises that you would think a lawyer should be familiar with if they were going to work with an expert or if they had cross-examined an assistant in me that would be helpful? Well, you know, the one thing I always say, I, I gave this talk to an insurance group last year, make sure that your expert is an expert. Mm -hmm and make sure that they are neutral. Like, I keep a book so that people know how many defense or plaintiffs or prosecutorial cases I've actually done. Um, you know, I've been in practice for 35 years, um, and I try to keep an equal share of that. But there isn't anything really to tell you that you're getting a good expert. Right. No, I mean, uh, when I say treatises, I, I mean, like, books on forensics and on pathology that would be that persons other than someone with a medical training it would be helpful to them yeah like, uh, I forget uh -huh. the Emmy from San Antonio wrote a, he's got a book Dr. DeMeo DeMeo yeah he actually has uh, for the last couple of years he has a nice handbook out yeah um, the CAP handbook is out College of American Pathologists Still one of the best uh, written books to understand forensics is Spitz and Fisher. Yeah, I was going to say Spitz that, and that's, Fisher. That's the Bible. And, and I it's have a, one it's of my an office. entertaining one to read, it even is. though it's thick. Mm -hmm. um, 
But you always have to have somebody, when it comes down to the forensic science aspect, it comes down to entomology, mm -hmm. anthropology, you want to make sure that the person that you're dealing with really has that expertise and is a good communicator. Because you don't want someone setting you up. Dr. Carr, do you have any questions for us? You mentioned you wanted to ask us some questions. Well, I was going to ask where you all came from. Well, they're from all over. From all over. Including California. Yeah, all right. I'm hearing you list my cities over there. I'm like, yeah. ooh, I want to hear so I, I I'm Alex Bunn. I'm the Chief Public Defender, and I started this office in 2010. Okay. When I came back to Harris County, I missed you because I was a lawyer practicing here from 1986 to about 1993. And I became an assistant federal defender and then a federal public defender. And I came back here to start the office in 2010. Oh, okay. Oh. So uh, a lot of these folks were, some of them were practicing in Harris County. Um, some came from other places and were public defenders other places. But uh, yeah, until 2010, there was no more public defender. I think that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we've, been, we've been lucky. We have good resources. We have very good investigators. That we here, here asking questions, and uh, uh, I kind of modeled it after the federal public defender's office. I had, I had, uh, I tried a federal capital murder case in Vermont where Michael Bond was the mm -hmm, expert mm -hmm. for the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we, we always, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office again prosecuted the adults in Washington, D.C., and the general counsel did the um, adolescents, but we always put on training for the public defender's office. Mm -hmm. It was a good cut, cut your teeth office. And they were always free to come over by themselves. And if they wanted a subject to be talked about, we would talk with them about it. And you know, then my training was to have an open open book and, and confidential. So I think that's the first start with making sure that whoever uh, the medical examiner is, the assistant medical examiner, you're able to talk to them and uh, communicate with your questions the opportunity to understand that, you know, our role, um